My name is Pilar Sugimoto. I am uh, affiliated with the Center of Medical Education and also a member of the Department of Global Health and Social Epidemiology here at the School of Public Health. Um, so today I'm going to talk about infectious disease epidemiology in the world. Uh, I understand that last week um, Associate Professor Tirani, she uh, talked about um, infectious disease through human history. Um, so today would be a little bit, um, I will take over from uh, maybe the last part of her talk. Um, I hope it's okay. I suffer from a little of allergies, so if I start coughing, I I'm, I'm apologize uh, beforehand. So let's uh, first see a little overview. Um, worldwide, it's estimated uh, that in 2012, um, there were 56 million people uh, who died. And from this number, most of them were due to non-communicable diseases, 68%. But a significant proportion of these deaths were also due to communicable diseases, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional conditions. Um, if we look a little further into this number, 17% of them are only attributed to infectious and parasitic diseases. 9% um, of, uh, of deaths uh, were due to injuries. But out of these uh, significant proportion, um, the distribution among the countries is actually very um, disproportionate. In low-income countries, 38% of the deaths are from infectious and parasitic diseases. So this tells us about how relevant it is uh, to study and talk about infectious diseases, especially in the global context. If we see here the top 10 causes of death for the year 2012, um, to, your, to your left, you can see the global. In the global uh, scale, uh, most of the um, causes are non-communicable diseases. And uh, although the disease patterns changes constantly, um, communicable diseases remain a leading cause of mortality and morbidity, especially in less developed countries or in low-income countries. You can see here highlighted in red. Um, to your right, uh, the column to your right uh, shows you the leading causes for low-income countries. Uh, so you can see how the top 10 causes are communicable diseases low respiratory infections, HIV AIDS, diarrheal diseases, and uh, malaria and tuberculosis. Um, so, um, um, but uh, if we group the countries, um, if we see them through the WHO region distribution, uh, we will see in this graph, for instance, how much um, of the burden is faced by different regions in the world. Um, if you see here to your left, the first two column, this is um, crude rate rate by cost of group. From the year 2000, we're comparing to the year 2012. So if you see here the, fir the first one, here is, for instance, year 2000 for the WHO region of Africa. We compare these to the year 2012. Okay, this is for the region of Africa, uh, Americas, Southeast Asia, Europe, Eastern Mediterranean, and Western Pacific. Um, if you see with the colors, the light blue will be communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional conditions. Um, so you can see here how much disparity there is between, between these regions, and especially in the WHO African region. Despite um, some um, positive changes that you can see here from the year 2000 to year 2012, um, the um, decline 
of communicable maternal neonatal and nutritional conditions, they are still bearing uh, much of the, of the, they are still facing much of the, the burden, globally speaking. Um, so I don't know if you are familiar um, with this measure, um, the DALIS. Has anybody ever heard about DALIS? Can you raise your hand? Yes? Okay, so it's good, it's not unfamiliar. For those of you who haven't heard about this, I'll quickly um, just mention what it means, okay? Um, this is actually a, a measurement. We, you know that the burden of the disease, you can see through incidence, through prevalence, uh, mortality. But we also have this other measure called DALI, okay? The World Bank, WHO, and the Harvard School of Public Health started this big project called the Global Burden of Disease uh, in the late 80s. And they developed this measure um, that stands for Disability Adjusted Life Years. Okay, this is a measure of the overall disease burden, um, and it's expressed in cumulative number of years lost due to ill health loss to disability, um, or to early death, to premature death, okay? Um, if we see here the graph, when we are born, um, generally we're healthy, and you have a certain life expectancy for uh, specific countries. So you're expected to live until this moment, right? But during the course of your life, you will be um, sick, you will be ill, you will have a disease. And uh, for that, you may have, sometimes you will be ill, then you will recover your health, you may be ill again. Or maybe at the end of your life, you can suffer from a disease, severely impairing um, your life. Or maybe you will die prematurely, meaning you will, li you will die before the life expectancy for the country. Okay, so if we sum uh, all these years that we lost because we were not in healthy condition or because we died prematurely, we'll have a measure uh, called DALI. Okay, and uh, we can use DALI um, actually to compare um, diseases that, for instance, may just kill you compared to those that instead of killing you, will give you um, disability or ill health uh, during a number of years, okay? This is to measure uh, different burdens of diseases. So in 2012, the total global burden of disease was more than 2,744 million DALIs, okay? Out of these, 21% was due to communicable diseases, all communicable diseases. So infectious diseases uh, will account for 21% of the DALIs, which will reflect the number of healthy years lost to an illness. Then we have different conditions here if you f see the figure. And um, HIV, you will review it next uh, class with uh, Professor Kihara. Uh, today I will um, talk a little about malaria, tuberculosis, and uh, other infectious diseases. But first, let's see some key terms so that we speak the same um, language and that we understand each other. Um, these are very basic terms that uh, we will be using throughout uh, the class and uh, most probably throughout the course. So I like to make sure that uh, we all understand the same thing. Um, incidence, for instance, uh, the measure of the number of new cases, okay? New cases of a characteristic such as an illness or, or a risk factor that will arise in a population on a given period of time. We have also incidence rate. We will mention the incidence rate, uh, which is a measure of frequency uh, with which a disease will occur in a population over a period of time. And typically it will be expressed as number of cases per person, year of observation. OK? 
Okay? And then we have prevalence. Okay? Prevalence will refer to the total number of individuals in a population who have a disease or a health condition at a specific period of time. Now, two other key terms that you may have already heard of last week with um, Associate Professor uh, Tirani was emerging disease. Do you remember this, right? Emerging disease are those diseases that have not occurred in humans before, or they have occurred previously, but affected only small numbers of people in isolated places. Okay? Um, or they have occurred throughout human history, but have only recently been recognized as a distinct disease due to an infectious agent. And then we have also re-emerging diseases. These are diseases that once were a major public health um, concern, uh, or globally or in a particular country, and then they decline dramatically. Uh, but they are again becoming health problems for a significant uh, proportion of the population, uh, such as the case of malaria and tuberculosis. And this is why I'd like to touch on these um, two diseases. Um, this figure is taken from a paper um, from uh, the authors Morens, and the title is The Challenge of Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Diseases Published um, in Nature. If you want to uh, read a little more about these. But this is just for you to see how many um, emerging and emerging diseases we have been having throughout uh, the time. The red ones represent the newly emerging diseases. Okay. The blue ones are re-emerging or resurging diseases, and the black ones are the re deliberately emerging diseases, uh, none other than bioterrorism. Okay, so in the whole world, we do have different diseases emerging in different places. Now, the most salient Another example, maybe, of an emerging infectious disease um, is HIV-AIDS, uh, which by now we know that very likely emerged a century ago. And after multiple independent events, uh, the virus jumped from a primate host to another and then subsequently uh, spread readily within the human population. Um, but uh, you will learn more about these next week. So this, this is a, a list um, of the major emerging infectious diseases. So you can see here the year to your left. Sorry, I have trouble between right and left. Um, so this is the year where they have been identified. And uh, this is the agent and uh, the disease they are causing. Um, here, for example, we have also in 2002 SARS, and uh, we will see a little about SARS also uh, very quickly. Um, other recent emerging, more recent emerging infections, uh, we see here 1997, this is up to 2003. Um, but it's not an exhaustive uh, list. So let's see uh, very quickly about, for instance, West Nile virus identified in 1999. West Nile virus is caused by a virus that is transmitted to humans by infected mosquitoes. And it can cause a febrile illness, so you'll have fever. Uh, it may cause encephalitis or inflammation of your brain, or meningitis, uh, which is inflammation of the linings of the brain and the spinal cord. So it's pretty serious. It was first isolated in Uganda in 1937, and from then on, it caused infrequent outbreaks uh, from uh, 1950s throughout the 1980s. 
um, in, in these countries, Israel, Egypt, India, France, and South Africa. But starting from the mid-1990s, the frequency and the severity and the geographic range of uh, West Nile virus um, has increased. Today, it is most commonly found in Africa, West Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. If we see this figure taken from a paper also published in the, um, this um, journal, Biomed Research International, um, I don't know if you can actually read from the handout. Sorry, it's uh, maybe a, uh, the font is too small. So I will read a little bit about um, the, the text here. Um, you see three colors in this figure. The red color um, shows you human positive cases of West Nile uh, virus. Okay, so these would be the red ones. Um, the blue ones, the blue area um, is for uh, mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes are positive to West Nile uh, virus. Um, obviously the gray one is uh, where there is no um, no information. So now you can see how it is really spread uh, throughout the world. For Japan, South Korea, Finland, and uh, Sweden, uh, actually it says uh, positivity for West Nile virus have been detected only in birds. Um, if we see, this is data from CDC in the United States. Um, this is the number of uh, cases of West Nile virus reported to CDC by year from 1999, 1999 to the year 2014. So the number of cases have been increasing. Uh, in 1999, they reported 62 cases, and by the year 2014, we now have more than 2,000 cases. Uh, the first case in Japan uh, was confirmed in October 2005. And uh, it was a male patient in, their, in his 30s, and he was returning from the US. Um, this is another example. Um, this is uh, SARS. You may all have heard about SARS in the news. Uh, SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And, um, this is data from the outbreak that we had in the year between 2002 and 2003. Um, SARS is a viral, respira uh, viral respiratory illness and it's called, uh, caused by a coronavirus called the SARS-associated coronavirus. In general, the disease will begin with high fever and it may have other symptoms like headache, um, feelings of discomfort, or body aches, and after two to seven days, uh, the patient may develop cough, okay? And most patients uh, will develop pneumonia. So SARS was first reported in Asia uh, in the year 2003. It was first reported in the year 2003. And over the next few months, uh, the illness spread to more than a dozen countries uh, in North America, in South America, in Europe, in Asia, uh, before the epidemic was contained. Okay. And scientists uh, believe that the virus emerged in China, in Guangdong province, um, that it infected people who handle or who inhale the virus droplets uh, from a mammal, a call a civet or civet. It's a cat-like mammal. Uh, by the year 2004, uh, the disease had already spread in humans, and uh, scientists are not sure whether it will return. Um, this is a global figure of um, the virus and deaths reported up to 2003. This is for the outbreak. Uh, the darker color shows you infections and deaths. Uh, a little lighter one uh, is four or more infections, and the light one is places with less than five infections. So SARS seems to spread uh, by close person-to-person -person contact, and uh, uh, it's thought to be transmitted uh, most easily 
through respiratory droplets. Uh, this is produced when an infected person cough or sneezes. Uh, so the virus can spread uh, when a person touches the surface or object contaminated with infectious droplets and then touches his mouth, his nose, or his eyes. Um, okay, so prior to the SARS outbreak, emerging infectious diseases were thought to take maybe weeks or months to spread globally. But the SARS uh, outbreak showed how efficiently a virus could spread through international travel. And um, by mid-2003, SARS virus had already spread to 29 different countries. So this is another list of major re-emerging infectious diseases. Um, we have here the column of the diseases and the pathogen and the transmission of the root vector. Okay. At the top we have here malaria, for instance, uh, transmitted through females Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, So we will review one of these diseases in the list, for instance, um, dengue fever. Dengue is caused by any of four close related viruses. Um, the infection with one serotype will not give you immunity to the others. Um, and sequential infections uh, will put people at greater risk for dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome. Um, dengue is transmitted between people by mosquitoes, um, Aedes aegypti or, and Aedes albopictus, uh, which are found throughout the world. And in many parts of the tropics and subtropics, dengue is endemic. Um, so the four dengue viruses originated in monkeys and then independently jumped to humans in Africa or Southeast Asia. And this was uh, maybe 100 or eight, uh, 800 years ago. And uh, I want to mention uh, this also that the um, disruption of World War II uh, in particular, the coincidental transport of the mosquito uh, around the world in cargoes are thought to have played a crucial role uh, in the dissemination of the viruses. Okay, and keep this in mind uh, because at the end of the session we will review some of the factors that drive um, the, the emergence of diseases. Um, so dengue fever was first documented only in the 1950s during epidemics in Philippines and Thailand. And it was not until 1981 that a large number of cases began to appear in the Caribbean and Latin America, uh, where highly effective AIDS control programs had been in place until uh, early 1970s. If we see a map of the, of the world, we can see here um, that uh, now dengue is endemic in at least 100 countries in Asia, the Pacific, the Americas, Africa, and the Caribbean. And uh, WHO estimates uh, that 50 to 100 million infections, million infections occur every year, um, including 500,000 of um, <coughs> cases in children and around 22,000 deaths also in children. So another emerging uh, disease that I think it would be uh, appropriate to mention uh, would be Ebola virus disease. Not uh, many years ago, we read on the news this big outbreak of Ebola, right? Um, <clears throat> what we need to know is that Ebola first appeared in outbreaks in Sudan and the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC. And this was in the 70s, in 1976. 
There are five species of Ebola virus that have been identified, and uh, four of them are known to cause diseases in humans. Uh, the Ebola virus disease is severe, as uh, probably you read on the news, it's really severe and uh, often fatal. Okay. Um, outbreaks have a case fatality rate of up to 90%. 90% of people infected will die from Ebola. Um, humans contract Ebola through contact with bodily fluids of infected animals or infected people. Um, the fruit bat, a bat, an animal, uh, is considered to be the natural host of the Ebola virus. So it's when people get in contact with the host that they become infected. And unfortunately, there is no specific treatment or vaccine available uh, for use in people or in animals. And I'd like you to see this, uh, this graph. Uh, we mentioned Ebola has been appearing since the 1970s, okay? So since 1976 until the big um, outbreak that we saw in the news until 2012, actually there were only a little more than 2,000 cases of deaths, okay? Uh, sorry, of, of total cases and uh, nearly 1,600 of deaths. And this is in a span of uh, how many? 30 something years, okay? And then what happened between 2014 and 2015? Suddenly we have this outbreak of Ebola. And uh, quickly it spread to more than one country. And we have now more than 20,000 suspected probable, probable or confirmed cases of Ebola and more than 10,000 deaths, okay? Um, most of the cases occurring in Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, and much less numbers in Nigeria. So um, this is taken from a paper publishing plus neglect the tropical diseases. And um, this is to review the socioeconomic and the environmental factors that uh, may have influenced Ebola's emergence, okay? Here we have factors such as environmental features, okay? Why these, mainly these three countries were severely affected by the outbreak. Um, there are also some human resources and infrastructure uh, factors that will facilitate the spread of the um, disease. For instance, look at these numbers. Number of physicians per thousand people in 2012. In all these countries, there is really um, not enough number of physicians to attend not only for Ebola cases, but in general to all other diseases. Um, improved sanitation, if we see how um, improved sanitation for these countries, only 19% for Guinea, 13% for Sierra Leone. Um, and you can see also how dramatically different it is if we see the rural and the urban here in Sierra Leone. Uh, improved sanitation in rural areas is only 7%, whereas in urban settings is 23%. Um, also, improved water source um, for these countries, all of them, less than 50%, um, they have improved water source, and as little as 25% for Guinea or Liberia. Um, when we see now some population features that also play a role, we see how the urban population has increased okay, um, in these places. 200, more than 200% increase since the 1960 to the moment of the outbreak in 2012. So urban population has increased uh, very quickly. Both three countries have civil unrest. 
Okay, so it, the context also plays a big role here. Uh, literacy is low, as low as 25% for 2010 in um, Guinea. And there were also some cultural and behavioral uh, features that um, proved to be a facilitator um, of the spread of the, the disease. Uh, for instance, the bushmeat consumption. This is the very f first fact that put people in risk. Um, do you know what bushmeat means? Anyone? Have you ever heard the word bushmeat? No? I guess. Okay, usually we get our proteins from um, meat, let's say uh, cow, fish, uh, poultry, right? But in some other places, some other settings, uh, it's uh, difficult to get the protein from these sources. So they get proteins from other types of animals, uh, wildlife animals. And this is bushmeat. Uh, so they will go to the forest and uh, they will catch or be in contact. They will hunt for wild animals, okay? And uh, this is very extended um, in these places. Um, then also the use of traditional burial practices. Um, in many countries, maybe your countries too, when someone passes away, when someone dies, we will usually maybe uh, hire services of a, a company or a, f a funeral um, a services. Um, but in these settings, it's traditional that when your relative dies, the members of the family will take care of the corpse. So they will wash the corpse. So if you can imagine if this person has had a disease, um, the body fluids become in contact with healthy individuals. So now these healthy individuals will also get infected. Okay, and these are traditions uh, very strongly, deeply, uh, deeply rooted in the, these settings. Um, this is a report from WHO. Uh, maybe the borders are not that clear, um, but uh, this is Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. And you can see how um, the spread of this disease has really cross national borders, okay? The diseases, they don't really need passport to go to the next neighboring country. Um, so they easily would spread along. Um, another more recent virus and outbreak that uh, we have seen is the Zika virus, right? Uh, this was very recent on the news. Um, and we now know the transmission, uh, probably mosquito-borne through Aedes species. And, but uh, then we also know that some transmission may be due to sexual transmission, okay? Sexual transmission, blood transfusion, mother to child maybe. Um, about the symptoms, uh, and this is the scary part, that they can be subclinical, meaning that they are not really prominent symptoms. Uh, it could look like a mild influenza. Um, some severe manifestations have been described, um, in including Guillain-Barre syndrome in adults and uh, possible microcephaly uh, in newborns of infected mothers. Uh, to this day, there is no effective treatment for the Zika virus. So um, for prevention, uh, there is no vaccine. And uh, the public health response is primarily focused on preventing the infection, because there is still a lot that we don't know. Um, Zika was declared public health emergency uh, this year in February. Um, but the virus um, has been already identified in 1947. Uh, it was 1948, uh, the virus was recovered from a mosquito Aedes in Uganda, 
And the first cases were detected in Uganda and uh, Tanzania, or United Republic of Tanzania, in the 50s. Um, then we have some human infections maybe across Africa and Asia through the 60s and 80s. Uh, but we saw uh, the large outbreak in the French Polynesia and the Brazil between 2013 and 15. So this is um, taken from WHO, and uh, you can see here, well, maybe not, not really, very clearly, uh, this is a timeline um, of the cases. And uh, now you can see how it has quickly spread to different parts of the world. So now I'd like to touch into um, malaria, okay? Um, worldwide, we already know that infectious diseases are leading causes of death um, in children and adults. And uh, malaria is also one of the um, leading causes. Let's see some uh, characteristics first about malaria. Um, malaria is caused by parasites uh, from the genus Plasmodium, so there are different types of um, parasites. Falciparum and uh, Vivax are the ones that pose the greatest threat, okay? And that disease is spread by the bite of a female mosquito. Some of the symptoms, uh, if you're not very familiar with malaria, uh, people will experience fever, they have some chills, and uh, symptoms like a flu, okay? If malaria is left untreated, if we don't have, we don't treat the patient, malaria can progress and have severe complications, and uh, ultimately it can result in death. Uh, so it is a life-threatening disease. Um, this is uh, some highlights of the World Malaria Report published recently in 2015 by the WHO, the World Health Organization. Um, and I'd like to mention a few um, key findings from this report um, about the incidence uh, globally. Uh, the number of malaria cases uh, has declined, this is positive, has declined 18%, okay? Uh, it has declined from 262 million in the year 2000 to 214 million in the year 2015. Uh, but in the, uh, for 2015, we know that the estimated cases are occurring also disproportionately uh, throughout all regions. 88% uh, of the cases are bare in the African region, okay? 10% in Southeast Asia region and only 2% in Eastern Mediterranean region. The incidence rate of malaria is estimated to have decreased. So it has decreased the incidence rate from 2000 to 2015 uh, by 37%, and this is good news. Um, so the target of the Millennium Developmental Goals, the MDGs, um, which was to halt uh, and begun to reverse the incidence of malaria, has been achieved, okay? Um, is everyone familiar with the MDGs? Have you ever heard about MDGs? Thank you. No? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Positive. Um, anybody else? Don't be shy. Just, um, uh, it's not an exam. <laughs> Just to see if uh, we're all, okay, yes. Um, so for those of you, maybe, um, is any, anybody wants to, to make a comment? No? No. Especially with the video, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so in the year 2000, actually, after the Millennium Summit, uh, a meeting of the member states 
um, all member states, the United Nations, they agree to eight um, goals, okay? And one of them, the sixth one, uh, was related to HIV, malaria, and other diseases. So this is a goal all these member countries and other international organizations uh, put their mind into, okay? We will have to reduce the number of um, HIV, K, uh, HIV infections and malaria and other diseases. So I will briefly mention when I uh, show you some of the findings, okay? Um, let's continue with uh, mortality. Also, um, it is a good news globally between the year 2000 and 2015, and uh, we're always comparing 2000 to 2015 because the the MDGs started in 2000, and it was a goal that they have uh, that will finish in 2015, okay? We will do this, we will work towards this goal, and we will measure it in the year 2015. So how good are we doing or how bad are we doing, okay? So that's why we're always uh, mentioning from the year 2000 to 2015. So there was a decline, 48% in the number of malaria deaths. Um, we went from more than 800,000 to 400,000, 438,000 um, in these 15 years. Uh, but again, the deaths um, are mostly occurring in the African region. 90% of them are in the African region. 7% in the Southeast Asia region and 2% in Eastern Mediterranean region, okay? Um, mortality, malaria mortality rate um, is decreasing also uh, by 60% globally. This is a graph, I hope you can see this. Um, this is for you to see in general the decline, the decline of 37% um, and here of 60%. This is years from the year 2000 to 2015 versus malaria cases per 100, when per um, 1,000 persons uh, at risk and malaria deaths per 100,000 persons at risk. Okay. So we see here there were large reductions in the number of cases and in the, and the number of deaths uh, between these 15 years. Um, now, if we see in more details uh, by region, we see here this is the percentage in decrease in the estimated malaria case incidence. This is incidence and uh, this is death rate, okay? How much people die, how much people got infected um, by different regions uh, from 2000 to 2015. Um, if you see here, this one reached zero. 100% reduction of their cases. And uh, this is the European, European regions. Uh, but uh, if we make an effort and we try to see this light color, this is the um, African region, okay? So we mentioned, yes, they have a decrease also in the incident, but uh, still it's uh, not as much as for other regions in the country. In, in the world. Um, the same is true also for um, uh, death rates. So some regions have achieved very impressive reductions in, in the burden, uh, but still there is a lot of work uh, for other regions, um, especially for the African regions. So this is the number of countries uh, with fewer than 1,110 cases uh, reported for um, malaria. Um, if we see here, the first dark uh, line would be the number of uh, countries reporting less than 10 cases, okay? Uh, this one in the middle will be those reporting less than 100 cases. And the lighter one are reporting less than 1,000 cases. So in general, we see that with time, in these 15 years, the number of countries reporting less and less cases are actually increasing. So more countries now 
more countries, this number of countries, more countries are reporting less cases. Um, if you remember from the previous slide, this one, um, this is the European region. So now we will see what happened here. Um, this is the elimination of malaria in the European region. Um, this is a graphic, this is a picture of um, malaria cases, indigenous malaria cases in WHO, the European region uh, from 1990 to 2015. And actually, um, in 1975, the European region, except from Turkey, was considered malaria-free. They were free of malaria. Um, but this achievement is, uh, as it was and is, is it now true, uh, is fragile. Um, why did we see this is Turkey? The light color, this is, uh, each of the colors will represent different uh, countries, okay? So why do we have this increase, especially in Turkey? Um, actually, this was following the first Gulf War and influx of refugees coming from Iraq. And then we have an increase also in other different countries, which was explained also um, as a consequence. This is coincidentally with the war in Afghanistan and the dissolution of the Soviet Union um, that was followed by reestablishment of local transmissions. So you see now how uh, maintaining zero indigenous cases will require a continue political commitment, um, constant vigilance um, against the reestablishment of um, transmissions. And of course, further investment to strengthen the health systems uh, to ensure that um, any resurgence can be rapidly contained. So when we see now, when we think about African region bearing most of the cases and most of the burden, um, we see the global burden of mortality is dominated now in countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and from them, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria, altogether, those two countries account for 35% of the global total. 35% only in these two countries um, of the estimated malaria deaths. So now let's see another um, disease that has been around and is still um, posing very uh, big challenges to, to the world, tuberculosis. Um, again, if you are not very familiar with this disease, uh, tuberculosis is caused by a bacterium, okay? A uh, bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Usually, it will affect your lungs. Um, it will give you pulmonary tuberculosis or pulmonary TB. Uh, but the bacteria can actually affect any other parts of your body. Um, it can affect any part of your body, and then it will be extrapulmonary uh, tuberculosis. But not everyone, not every person who gets infected with tuberculosis, with the, the, the bacteria, uh, will become sick. And these persons will be in with latent tuberculosis infection. Uh, but if they are not treated properly, um, they can develop the disease. And those who develop disease, if not treated properly, it could be fatal. Um, a few signs and symptoms for tuberculosis. Um, usually tuberculosis in the lungs may cause you to cough at least three weeks or longer. You have experienced pain in the chest. Uh, you may cough blood or sputum. And some other symptoms uh, that the patients may, may have, weakness, fatigue, 
Uh, they will lose a lot of weight, weight loss. They will not have appetite. Uh, they will experience chills or fevers or sweats um, at night. Um, the symptoms of tuberculosis disease in other parts of the body will depend on the um, affected area. Okay, so now again, uh, WHO uh, publishes the Global Tuberculosis Report every year, and this is uh, some highlights from the latest report in 2015. Um, they have been publishing this since 1997. And, um, including the main findings, okay? Um, so in the latest report, um, the absolute number of incident cases, again, of new cases, new people diagnosed, is falling, but it's falling slowly, okay? It's 1.5 per year since the year 2000. And uh, there's an estimate of nearly 10 million, 9.6 million people um, newly reported in the year 2014. Um, more than half of them are in the Asian region, 58% of them, and 28% of them in the African region, um, and uh, much less in the other regions. Uh, Something important here, 12% of the cases of tuberculosis are HIV positive. Uh, 1.2 million new HIV positive uh, tuberculosis cases. And three quarters of these cases are in the African region. Um, as to prevalence, we have an estimated 13 million prevalent cases, 13 million people having the disease. Okay? And the prevalence rate by the end of 2015 was 42% uh, lower than in 1990, which is something encouraging. Um, regarding mortality, uh, estimated 1.5 million deaths people dying from tuberculosis, okay? And from these, nearly 400,000 of them were among people with HIV, okay? So now you are starting to think the importance of the link between tuberculosis and HIV. Um, the tuberculosis mortality rate in 2015 was lower than in 1990, 47% uh, lower. Uh, but now tuberculosis is ranking along HIV as a leading cause of death worldwide. Um, this is a figure taken also from the report uh, from the WHO. And uh, to your right, to your left, here you, set, you have the um, countries with the highest absolute numbers. Okay, so this is measuring only the number of cases, absolute numbers. Um, in terms of absolute numbers, uh, the top 10 countries are these ones. Of course, this is a not very uh, appealing top 10 uh, list. From this list, um, more than half of the absolute numbers are bare in these five countries, India, Indonesia, China, Nigeria, and Pakistan, all together are reporting 54% of the total global. But these are absolute numbers. Um, and the graph to your right uh, takes a look at the number of new tuberculosis cases, but relative to the population size um, of the country, or in other words, the incidence rate, okay? And uh, if we take in account the population size, then Lesotho is the worst affected. If we check the global incidence rate, global, in all the countries, in average, they have 133 cases per 100,000 people. 
in Lesotho, in South Africa, we are um, seeing more than 800 cases per 100,000 population. So it's very, very much higher than the global. So we see that the number of new tuberculosis cases relative to the population, or in other words, the incidence rate, varies widely among different countries. Here you can see, this is a map um, showing you different um, estimated new tuberculosis cases per 100,000 people. Okay, so the darker the color, the highest the incidence. Now you can see how it's concentrated in some part of the world. The lowest rates, the very, very light color, the lowest rates are found mainly in high-income countries, okay? Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand. Um, if you see here, this is um, a small graph that I, I put here. This is showing you the rate per 100,000 population, but this is grouped by the regions. Okay, you have here the region of the Americas, Europe, and this is Southeast Asian region and the African region. This is versus cases per year uh, by thousands. So you see here how um, the region of the Americas, the region of the Americas, um, has the lowest burden of tuberculosis on average. If we see globally, um, the incidence rate, the incidence rate um, was relatively stable uh, from 1990, from 1990, this 1990 to 2015. The incidence rate was relatively stable. And then around the year 2000, from the year 2000, uh, it started to fall, okay? And this is for prevalence, and uh, this is for mortality. Okay. Um, the dotted line is actually showing you what was the goal with the MDGs. Okay. If we see now, this one was global, the global uh, view, but we see now for the different regions, we see how they have been doing in terms of uh, incidence rate. This is from the year 1990 to 2015. Uh, you can see here how it really had a more uh, steep uh, fall in the Americas compared to Africa, for instance. So the MDGs uh, target uh, were met in all the six um, WHO regions. They half, they stopped, and they reduce. They start decreasing the incidence. <coughs> this is the estimated prevalence of tuberculosis. This is from 1990 to 2015 for all the regions. You have here Africa, the Americas, Eastern Mediterranean, Europe. Southeast Asia and Western Pacific. Um, and these horizontal lines will represent the target, the target goal for the MDGs, okay? This is a 50% reduction in the prevalence rate by the year 2015 compared to what they had in the year 2000, okay? So actually before the 2015, some regions had already achieved their goals. And for the others, they are still uh, not reaching. Others are very close.
This is the estimated HIV prevalence uh, in new and relapsed tuberculosis cases. Again, we can see how disproportionate it's affecting to different countries in the world. The darkest colors showing you highest prevalence um, also concentrated in certain parts of the world. And I, as I was uh, earlier mentioning about tuberculosis and uh, HIV, tuberculosis now ranks alongside HIV as leading cause of death from an infectious disease. If you see here, this is the top causes of death worldwide. Um, this is a much nicer figure from the very first one that I show you. Um, you have here ischemic heart disease, strokes, lower uh, respiratory infections, and here you have tuberculosis, okay? This is worldwide, top causes of death. And here you have HIV and AIDS. But now you have cases of tuberculosis that are also HIV positive. So there's an estimated 1.5 million uh, tuberculosis deaths in the year 2014. 1.1 uh, were non-HIV positive, so HIV negative uh, patients. But 390,000 of them were HIV positive, this figure, okay? And the thing is that HIV positive patients dying for tuberculosis um, under the international coding, they will be coded as a cause of death as HIV, okay? So there is a group there that are actually also having tuberculosis and uh, maybe they are not being counted for tuberculosis uh, numbers. So globally in 2014, uh, there were in average uh, 16 tuberculosis deaths per 100,000 population. Um, this is among uh, HIV negative patients. Okay. Uh, but uh, maybe approximately 80% of the deaths um, among HIV negative people is occurring in African region and Southeast regions. So there is a considerable variation. There is a very dramatic variation um, between or among countries. This is a nice figure also showing um, the different regions of WHO, Africa, the Americas, Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, Southeast Asia, and Western Pacific. Again, the dotted line is the goal, okay, the MDG's goal. But this one reflects the mortality rate, the global mortality rate, excluding those who are HIV positive. Um, the mortality rate in globally has fallen 47% in this uh, time, timeline. Uh, some of these regions have done much better um, than others, are still close, close to the goal, but not there yet. Another important issue about tuberculosis, and this is true also for malaria, even though I didn't touch it, but um, is drug resistant, okay? We all know how, how long and how many drugs we have to take uh, when you are infected with tuberculosis. Um, anybody, maybe a doctor among you would like to share now a comment? No, okay, everybody is shy. <laughs> okay, I'll do it then. Um, so the first line of uh, treatment for tuberculosis, you have to take um, several drugs for six months. So six months taking the drugs, okay? Um, then you have, of course, second line uh, therapy and so on. But a big issue would be multidrug resistant. 
Multidrug resistant tuberculosis is when you develop resistance to at least rifampicin or isoniazid, um, which are two of the most powerful first line anti uh, TV drugs. So imagine you have the first line you have to take for six months and then you stop taking, you develop resistance to the, the drugs. And uh, even more dramatic would be that you develop more resistant to the second line. Uh, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis or XDR TB is multi drug resistant, so resistant to these two uh, first line drugs, plus resistant to at least one fluoroquinolone and a second line injectable um, drug. So this poses a big challenge uh, to the fight and the control of the epidemic. The first, um, it was first identified in South Africa in 2005, uh, extensively drug resistant uh, to tuberculosis. And it will definitely pose a threat, not only to the country where it arises, but globally to control the tuberculosis um, epidemic. So globally, and this is talking about drug-resistant tuberculosis, globally, um, we estimate 3.3% of new tuberculosis cases and 20% of those previously treated cases as having multidrug resistant tuberculosis. And um, this will remain, it has remained virtually unchanged in recent years. Um, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis has been reported by already 105 countries uh, by 2015. And an estimated nearly 10% of the people with multidrug resistant tuberculosis have extensive drug resistant um, tuberculosis. In 2014, there were an estimated more than 400,000 new cases of multidrug resistant tuberculosis worldwide. And uh, nearly 200,000 people die from multidrug uh, resistant tuberculosis. If we see here now globally, the number, this is the number of multidrug resistant tuberculosis that is estimated to occur among those who are notified of uh, tuberculosis. This is for the year 2014. So more than half of the patients were in India, China, and the Russian Federation. So you can see here uh, with the darker colors. So what is driving the emergence uh, and the re-emerging of infectious diseases? Uh, along my talk, I have mentioned few of them. Uh, now we'll try to put them uh, a little more organized. So we have different drivers, and the list uh, is increasing. Uh, first, the increasing population, OK? Population is. Um, growing. The explosive increase in the number and rapidity, rapidity of commutation. Now you can go from one place to another in a few hours. In only one day you can go across the globe. right? Um, the import and the export of food stock is also a driving factor. Um, some diseases of development like construction of dams can also affect the expansion of human residential area, more urbanization, growing uh, spaces, and uh, um, uh, moving away some um, hosts. The import and the export of animals, the breeding of large quantity of poultry, 
And uh, definitely, despite some uh, group of people trying to uh, reject these, the global warming and the climate change, very much real and also affecting um, war and refugees. I have uh, slightly mentioned also how in some of these diseases, war and refugees uh, movement also can affect the spread of disease. The increasing nursery schools, and I think uh, if there are some mothers here or people having small children, you may know that once your children start going to nursery, they start getting a lot of diseases, not only care, but the kids will share a lot of uh, these uh, viruses or bacteria. Increasing elderly care facilities, again, the same people confined in a place also will increase the, um, the risk and the, 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 the possibilities of getting an infection. The abuse of antibiotics, um, maybe in Japan is much more restricted, the use of antibiotics, but in many other places of the world, um, not only medical doctors prescribing um, a lot of antibiotics many times were uh, not necessarily needed, but also you can uh, obtain antibiotics over the counter very easily without a prescription. Okay, so this also fuels the resistant. Um, increased virulence of pathogens. We have seen how pathogens are constantly mutating and changing and evolving and uh, posing and uh, constantly challenged to the uh, advancement of technology. And of course, we cannot forget about bioterrorism. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's still a, a threat. So I'm not going to go over each and every one of them, um, but um, you can See a little of uh, a few of them now reorganized. This is taken from um, a paper publishing emerging infectious diseases, um, how appropriate the journal, uh, factors in the emergence of infectious diseases. And you can see here some factors. These are the factors. And examples of specific factors um, under these, these titles and examples of diseases that they may be um, uh, related to. Okay, for example, if we see here human demographics and behavior um, as a factor, uh, society events, population growth and migration, uh, people moving especially from rural areas to urban areas or now uh, displacing from one country to another, War or civil conflict in many parts of the world, they are experiencing um, war and conflict still. Uh, urban decay or different sexual behavior, um, as for instance, intravenous drug use or maybe um, use of high density facilities. All these may have played a role in introducing HIV, uh, for example. Uh, the spread of dengue, the spread of HIV, and other sexually transmitted infections. Okay, we now have seen also how international travel and commerce also is playing a huge role. We mentioned how in only one day we can go from one place, one point in the globe to the complete opposite part of, of the globe. So worldwide movement of not only people but also goods and the air travel facilitates, okay? With people and with goods, also some um, bacteria, some viruses, uh, and some other um, illnesses may be traveling along. Um, the airport malaria, dissemination of mosquito vectors um, are some of these examples. This is a report from CDC in the United States. Uh, it says, Lassa fever confirming death of US traveler returning from Liberia. So a person was coming back, maybe home, from a different country. And the important of all these texts is, the patient did not have a fever on departure from Liberia. 
did not report symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting, or bleeding during the flight. And his temperature was taken on arrival in the US and he did not have a fever at that time. Okay, so they travel so fast, they don't have time to develop any symptoms, but yet they develop on the other side and then they may be um, risking also other people. Um, these are some examples of how, again, a little more, and I cannot emphasize uh, these uh, m more, how diverse environmental changes can affect also the occurrence of various infectious diseases. And this is taken uh, from the WHO. If you are curious to read a little bit more about it, at the uh, bottom of the slides, I put the URL. Um, they're all shortened URLs, so I didn't want to put a very long one. Um, but here you can see how environmental changes um, can also be involved and relate to the spread of different diseases and uh, how these, uh, what is the pathway um, to do this. Um, here you can read later uh, with more details about dams and canals and irrigation um, activities also, maybe um, helping the spread of malaria or chistosomiasis and so on. Some agricultural intensification or urbanization and urban crowding, how putting more people in a confined space also can fuel, for instance, um, outbreaks of cholera, dengue, or other diseases. Deforestation and new habitation for the mosquitoes, for instance, or reforestation, uh, or ocean warming, or more precipitation, more rain, okay? Climate change, it's raining more, so it's changing the environment also. Um, so this is the last slide. You have seen last week how infectious disease severely and dramatically affected human population throughout history. And now you have seen also how it's currently still affecting much of the population, especially to some regions in the world. Um, so this is for us to remember that the infectious diseases are still very Per persistent threat. Um, and most of these threat and these deaths are occurring in low and middle income countries. Um, so we still have um, um, very much to be vigilant and uh, aware of, of this. Okay. Thank you very much. This is my last slide. If you have any